Good morning from New York City at Columbia University's Harriman Institute. My name is Tanya Domi, and I am an adjunct professor with the Harriman Balkan Studies Program, and I will be moderating today's annual Balkan Roundtable, The Balkans on Tenterhooks. The Harriman Institute at Columbia University is one of the world's leading academic institutions for the study of Russia, Eurasia, and East Central Europe. Our mission is to serve our community at the university and beyond by supporting research, instruction, and dialogue, sponsoring vibrant and multidisciplinary events, and bring together our extraordinary resources of faculty, students, and alumni. We are committed to training the next generation of regional specialists to play leadership roles in setting the academic and scholarly agenda making policy and challenging accepted truths about how we study our rapidly changing world. Today's discussion is situated at a momentous time of political strife that cuts across the Western Balkans region against the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic. Front burner issues include a precarious Bosnia and Herzegovina, that manages to muddle through one crisis to another without improving conditions in politics while fending off encroachments from Zagreb and Moscow and corrosive acts by the Serbian leadership. Not to be outdone, the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue spiked into hostilities over license plates, but not really, at the Serbia-Kosovo border last month that saw a military escalation by Serbia at the border. And after a meeting in Brussels with Mr. Lejak, the crisis seems to have momentarily pacified. EU enlargement has been frozen for the time being for North Macedonia and Albania, and even brought more broadly. But according to Angela Merkel, who was making her farewell tour she said one last time, the Balkans should be brought closer to the EU. Brain drain and corruption has afflicted every state of the former Yugoslavia, including Croatia, the newest EU member state. No politician seems to have a plan for how to keep the skilled and educated class of Balkan citizens employed at home. The rise of Russia and China looms large in the region, neither advancing democracy, and both have played outsized roles in Montenegro's internal affairs. Turkey's interesting relationship with both Serbia and Bosnia cuts in multiple ways politically, but one thing is for sure, the illiberal set of Balkan politics, uh, Balkan politicians rather, talk the same language, let's stay in power. Opining on these issues today are some of the most experienced Balkan analysts and journalists from the region. We intend to have a vigorous discussion about the challenges confronting the region from within and by major powers engaged in the region who are not advancing democracy during a time of disappointment with the European Union. Yesterday, an open letter was sent and issued by diaspora groups to Congress representing Bosnian and Kosovar Repu Americans about their concerns of the Serbian government rhetorical and military escalations of recent. So as this uh, conversation begins and throughout it, please, in the audience, please submit your comments in the Zoom or in the live stream chats we will try to respond to as many questions as possible. Our first speaker is Dr. Kurt Bassinger, who is co-founder and senior associate of the Democratization Policy Council. And he recently received his PhD from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, doing his dissertation on peace cartels, internationally brokered power sharing and perpetual oligarchy in Bosnia and Herzegovina and North Macedonia. The microphone is yours, Kurt. Thank you very much, Tanya. And I just dropped some things into the chat and it got truncated. So I'll pick that up after I speak and, and add the rest. 
thank you all for, for having me and thank you all of you for tuning in. I'll open with the point that I thought at this point, a year after your last uh, regional survey, uh, Tanya, that we'd be in a better place than we are. Um, uh, those of us in, in my think tank, Democratization Policy Council have advocated, you know, this was an opportunity for a strategic reset after the transatlantic difficulties uh, driven heavily by the last administration. Uh, and in the Western Balkans where evidently the policies uh, have not been working. Uh, but that has not been the case. Uh, instead, the, the Biden administration has effectively picked up where the last administration left off in a very transactional approach to the region, a sort of let's make a deal approach that we first saw with, uh, with Vucic and Thaci uh, on the so-called land swap with Kosovo, then later manifest in the Mostar deal that uh, between the two ethnic uh, ruling parties in uh, in that city, excluding everybody else. So essentially a, 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 an agreement among oligarchs. Uh, and now, uh, as I'll talk about very briefly in a moment, uh, on the election law. Uh, so you, you have this sort of actuarial policy making that we saw in, uh, in the, the callous and, and chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan, of sort of clearing the ledger. Uh, and unfortunately, this is, this is the simplistic low road I think of terms of, of, of managing the Western Balkans. Uh, so in the absence of a strategic uh, reset, you have a lot of tactical cooperation with the European Union uh, in effect to, uh, to, to in search of a deliverable in the hope of, of, of pacification, uh, pacifying the region, uh, as well as uh, camouflaging the, the lack of progress uh, the, up until now. To prevent a reckoning with the with a policy that has been failing, um, I'd wager that Bosnia Herzegovina of in the Western Balkans is is the epicenter of what is a, a conflict system, and the fact that it has 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 become unstable uh, is owes directly to uh, a, a Western policy that the United States has essentially taken second fiddle in 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 supporting that has been based heavily on enlargement. Uh, for the past 16 years, the idea that enlargement will solve it, and therefore we, we don't need to we don't need other tools. Uh, one of the things that's very worrisome right now is uh, the deterrent force that is uh, is mandated in the Dayton Peace Agreement, uh, originally conducted by NATO and I4 Implementation Force S4, now U4 since the end of 2004 under the European Union, but but backed by NATO through Berlin Plus arrangements. Um, is on the chopping block. It comes up for its renewal every every year at the UN Security Council. And uh, the Russians and the Chinese have recently voiced their displeasure about the new choice, choice of uh, international high representative, German Christian Schmidt. Uh, and there's a, a distinct possibility that might be vetoed. Uh, to my knowledge, there is not a real fallback. I think there's a legalistic fig leaf that will just sort of bring this back under NATO's umbrella because uh, the NATO headquarters is also under the same chapter seven UN Security Council mandate. Uh, but I, the force has not been reinforced. Uh, one of the links that I, I put into the chat was, was our, our policy note on this uh, where we, we talk about the deterrence failure that's impending uh, and, and how to get ahead of that. Um, the, the fixation du jour uh, and for the past little while was sort of presaged in this Mostar deal between the, the HDZ uh, and the SDA. Uh, and it's uh, for changing the election law to ensure effectively that, that Dragan Chovic is the Croat, that has the Croat seat on the presidency. Uh, that's the driving force of it. Um, uh, it is being promoted as electoral law reform and limited constitutional reform uh, necessitated by a number of European Court on Human Rights rulings, the Sage Finci case, many of you have heard about the Zornich case, which is sort of the outer perimeter. Uh, she had, she had uh, and that's another article that I put into the chat. She wrote an article recently in Just Security about what she sees wrong with, the, with this fixation of the United States, European Union, Britain to get these election law changes. Um, uh, the, the talk about electoral integrity, I would posit, is window dressing. Uh, 
uh, sort of camouflage for what amounts to an appeasement policy that is encapsulated in this in this electoral law reform. Um, and uh, I, I worry, uh, even though there's been a headline about uh, about uh, corruption in the region and the executive order that was issued in June, I worry that that's going to be employed in a way that might actually discredit that what could be a very useful tool regionally. You know, I'd like to see it run like a lawnmower over across, over the entire political elite of the Balkans. Instead, I have a feel, fear that it'll be used instrumentally to achieve tactical policy goals. Um, so watch that space to see what where sanctions land if they are applied. Um, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina is what I'd call a peace cartel, where effectively the the parties at Dayton or their successors have effectively leveraged fear and patronage uh, both against their own citizens, but also against us. And the patronage comes down from us because we're afraid of destabilization and just the absorption of bandwidth uh, in terms of our our ability to pursue policy. So. Effectively, we've adopted a pacification approach, and I'd say this applies to many of your countries too, as we'll, we'll hear further in the discussion. The justification for this, and I know I'm running out of time, I'm very, very quick. The justification for this that one hears in Washington is essentially a geopolitical one. Um, but uh, that that uh, that we, you know, this is geopolitical keep away, and if that's the case, uh, that benefits leaders. And we, we saw that in the Cold War, particularly in the developing world, and we're still carrying all that baggage from the relationships we, we adopted then. But I think this is actually even worse than that. It's going to be counterproductive. Um, it feeds the arbitrage that Vucic in particular has demonstrated, but all these guys have played. These guys are offering me X. What are you going to give me instead? Um, and I uh, and I so democracy is about practice, not just alignment. And I worry that we've lost sight of that regionally. Um, so I'll close with the only the only way forward that I see is that some sort of popular agency against the powers that be to say this isn't what we want. The only advantage I'd say is the clarity that effectively the the, the West is operating as a geopolitical actor as the other actors. And, and demonstrating that its priorities are not really on what the headline calls of democracy, good governance, but about alignment. Um, and uh, to, to, to segue over to Ivana and with North Macedonia, the only, the time that you did have forward progress in the region recently, and I think a lot of it has been squandered, was precisely because it came from the bottom up and it forced us to get off the fence. And that was in North Macedonia between, between 2015 and 2017. So now I'll Stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Tanya, you're muted. Uh, let me introduce Ivana. Uh, she is a former advisor to the Prime Minister of North Macedonia, uh, and she has worked in the region, including at the OSCE mission to Bosnia and Herzegovina. She is currently pursuing her PhD in political science and international relations at the University of Southern California. You have the mic, Ivana. Hi, thank you. Um, this feels like I'm back in primary school because again, I, there's more than just one Ivana in, in the room, even if it's <laughs> virtual. Um, okay. So I will like to talk to you a little bit about what's been happening in North Macedonia uh, over the past year. And since this is at least partially connected, inspired, influenced, impacted by the COVID crisis, um, I'd like to start with a couple of numbers that have been um, in many ways like very often quoted in the country. Uh, we do have overall since the start of the pandemic 3.5% case fatality, which means that from all the people that get COVID, 3.5% die. Um, in other ways to look at it is to look at number of deaths per 100,000 uh, population. And there we have 328, which puts us right at the top in the world. Um, we are doing better, a bit better than Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we're doing worse than Montenegro and Bulgaria, which are just um, next to us. So if you think about these numbers, uh, what do they mean? 
Um, if there's a high number of deaths per population count, but not that high of a percentage of deaths per positive COVID cases, it means that we have a huge percentage of the population that has been infected at some point during the pandemic. And that we should think about why is that so? Why are we seeing those numbers and these trends? And one of the things that we can think of is that the measures for one or another reason didn't work. Whatever was done were, was either not enough, not done well, or was not respected. And so you can look at it in two, in two ways. The measures weren't good or the public didn't follow the measures. And it's probably a mixture of both, but if we look at them separately, uh, what did the government do that was good or bad? Some of the measures just were introduced too late. Some of the measures weren't implemented fully. And we particularly had a problem with measures relating to public gatherings, uh, especially things like weddings, religious holidays, um, where there simply wasn't enough will to implement the measures well enough. And here we come to, you know, it's not just about introducing the measures, but actually having the ability and the willingness to implement them. And this was lacking in a lot of cases. Um, we did have curfews, which some of them did have an, an effect of lowering the number of cases, but some of them, you know, were lifted a bit too early. Now, if you look at the other side of it, it's that the public didn't follow the measures. Um, and that says something about trust in institutions. And I think that this is something that has been a chronic problem in the country. Now, if we look at this government um, or the governments led by um, Zoran Zaev since 2017, there have been a lot of mistakes that could have been avoided. Many of them were HR mistakes. Um, some of them were done because of what Kurd refers to as peace cartels, appeasement to uh, the coalition partners. Um, and we, we've seen this erode an already weak level of trust in institutions. My most recent research that I just, I'm, I'm just working through all the data shows that when people uh, are introduced or reminded of surveillance software in the country, their trust in institutions goes down. And so if you think back to North Macedonia in 2015, 2016, we have months and months of presentation of how much the government had wiretapped us. So the level of trust in institution was never, it was never great. I think it plummeted in 2015. And I don't think it has been, been built up um, in the last uh, six years. So all of that together means that we've, we've been facing a really, um, a really bad situation in terms of COVID. Um, this also means that people just don't go to the hospital on time. Um, we don't have enough space in the hospitals, but that's a problem that's almost worldwide. But people just don't show up in the hospital on time. They go too late, and then there's very little that can be done for that. Now, I don't want this to be completely um, negative or pessimistic overview. One of the good things that we've managed to do um, in the past period is conduct a census, the first one in almost 20 years. Um, and we are actually, a lot of people were surprised that we are 1.8 million. Uh, we were afraid that we would be, we would be a lot less. Um, and that is, this is good for multiple reasons. We can finally start hopefully implementing more evidence-based policies. We are currently facing an energy crisis, and this is partially connected to COVID, uh, partially because of simply we haven't had enough um, infrastructure investment into um, energy plants. And finally, what has been deservedly so or not, the main topic when it comes to North Macedonia is the situation with Bulgaria and the accession negotiations. Um, the latest demands that were formulated by the um, Bulgarian Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, when they met with the Croatian Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, was that there are basically six demands. The first one that Bulgarians are recognized as a minority in the constitution of North Macedonia. 
that's my six minutes up and I'll just wrap up that the short and the long name of the country, the Republic of North Macedonia is the same as North Macedonia, that we don't show any territorial pretensions, that we stop the hate speech towards Bulgaria, uh, that we rehabilitate the victims of communism. And I, I suspect that there are specific victims of communism that they're talking about. Um, that there's greater engagement and involvement of the Commission on Historical Issues between Bulgaria and North Macedonia. And the last one is my personal favorite, and that is that we do not interfere with internal affairs of Bulgaria. Um, so with that, I'll wrap up and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana. Oh, so our next speaker is Akri Sipa, uh, who is a, a, a foreign policy expert and consultant based in Tirana, Albania. His areas of interest include regional cooperation in the Balkans, EU enlargement and security issues, obviously democratization processes. He's been published in a number of uh, newspapers, including uh, the Jerusalem Post, Balkan Insight, among others. Full disclosure, he is a former student of mine. Akri. Thank you, Professor. And as I said, it, it's a pleasure to be here today and to be invited by you in this very interesting discussion on, on Balkan affairs and Balkan developments. I, I'll start a little bit with Albania in terms of the internal developments, and then I'll move a little bit in terms of the external and foreign policy issues that have arisen in Albania recently. In terms of uh, internal developments, I think that the, the main focus has been the return, the, the return to normalcy. Unfortunately, for the last five years, Albania has had a weird situation in the fact that it started a very painful and long so far judicial reform uh, through the support of the United States and the European Union as well. But uh, it was painful because it started betting the, the previous judges and prosecutors and it left the institutions without them. So we didn't have a functioning constitutional court, we didn't have a functioning high court for, for, for at least three years. And this created all sorts of issues in terms of judicial issues, but also in terms of political issues, because the some of the high uh, level cases that were brought to these courts by, by, by the opposition, by different civil society organizations were left un unanswered due to the fact that we didn't have the, the institutions in place. So uh, fortunately, in uh, in last uh, in the last year in December, the 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 constitutional court became functional again, and it started uh, reviewing its first cases in January of 2021, and uh, this creates uh, all sorts of dynamics for the country in terms of the expectations that there that there have been. Uh, there there were many expectations by the Albanian people. The, as I said, the, the process was strongly supported by the US and the EU, uh, which considered it a prerequisite for, for Albania's path in the EU integration. But the slow pace of the reform, coupled with some artificial barriers created by politicians, as well as efforts to gain, uh, to again politicize the judicial system, uh, created some sort of skepticism. So now it's very important to see how this uh, new institutions will be effective, whether they'll be independent and impartial, as it was promised, but uh, it's uh, it's good to see this return to normalcy in in the in the in this institutional framework, especially in this third branch of government. On the other hand, Albania had uh, elections this year, parliamentary elections, uh, and uh, for the third consecutive mandate, we have the socialist governing again, led by Prime Minister Redirama. It's uh, the elections were hard fought, and there were some controversies, including from the from the monitoring uh, from the monitoring partners, especially the OSCE, which uh, said that there were issues in terms of uh, voting fraud, in terms of uh, rigging some some uh, in, in rigging in some ways the, the elections by by the by the government using its its uh, the advantage that uh, governing gave to it to the socialists, but. The, the, the big thing was that the Democratic Party eventually, dis despite uh, the, the accusations for voting fraud, uh, decided to recognize the, the results and join parliament. 
This is big because since 2019, we didn't have the, the opposition in parliament. The, the Democratic Party, the biggest opposition party, decided to abandon the parliament together with its junior partners because of what they, uh, they, they saw as um, the decision of the government to work with crime and mafia to retain power. It was a big decision at the time, criticized by many, including the international partners of Albania, and which uh, created this spiral uh, that uh, led to all sorts of abuses and criticism by, by uh, the international partners. Fortunately, the decision to, to recognize the elections and to eventually join the parliament, it's interesting because it, again, uh, we're living, it means that we're leaving behind this kind of abnormal political situation and we're going back to the normalization of the political process. The third major development in, in the internally, it's actually related to something that it was announced by the State Department, which is the, the public designation of Salih Berisha, the former prime minister and former president of Albania, uh, by the State Department for significant corruption. It's, uh, it, as one of the longest serving politicians in the country and one of the most powerful ones, uh, Mr. Salih Berisha uh, still retains uh, considerable support within the Democratic Party, within the base, and the decision of Lurzim Basha, the current leader, to, to expel him from the parliam parliamentary group due to the pressure from the United States and the public designation, specifically, uh, has created a sort of dynamic with the opposition in which Mr. Sali is challenging Mr. Basha for, for, for the leadership of the party, for the leadership of the Democratic Party. This fragmentation of the Democratic Party if it happens eventually, it seems like there's a good chance that it's gonna happen, uh, can lead to two important outcomes in terms of internal developments, which is, first of all, the fact that it's gonna uh, suck a lot of energy from the opposition, which otherwise would be used to scrutinize the government and uh, hold it accountable. Uh, it, it will ma make the, the life of the government much easier if there is this kind of fragmentation within the, Demo the Democratic Party. But on the other hand, it, there is the chance that it might open the, and broaden the political arena because so far the, the political life has been dominated by these two large parties, the Socialist Party and the Democrat, Democratic Party, and uh, has been monopolized in a way by, by the leaders of, of the parties, whoever they, they were in the respective mandates. So, so there is this chance now for, for opening the, 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 the political arena a little bit. Thank yes. you. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll come back and discuss some of these issues around Albania, which seems to have gotten a lot of positive press because they, they accepted refugees from Afghanistan. I want us to talk about that later and what that's all about in terms of soft power. Um, now over to Lubomir Filipovic, uh, who's a political scientist from uh, Montenegro, is an activist as well, works as an analyst and consultant with different governmental and non-governmental and private institutions there. Um, Lubomir, you have the microphone. Thank you, Tanya. So I'll try to follow the instructions regarding the time. So I'll jump right into what's been happening in Montenegro in the last month. I'm gonna credit <laughs> you with one minute. Thank you. So you've been, uh, I think you've all seen the scenes, dramatic scenes from Montenegrin streets last month. Uh, the riots in Cetinia, violence, standoff between the uh, protesters and police, the tear gas, small town of Cetinia, the old royal capital was almost uh, covered in, in, in the, uh, with the cloud of tear gas that was used by the police during the enthronement of the Serbian Orthodox Church Metropolitan in Cetinje. Uh, this particular event, uh, I perceive it as, as a culmination of, of a long-term process that's been taking place since several years ago, uh, and most notably since the 2019, end of 2019, when uh, the church uh, protest movement was triggered by the uh, passing of the law on religious freedoms by the Montenegrin parliament. Uh, it took place, the, this protest movement took place uh, at the same time uh, with the political campaign, elections campaign last year, and then it resulted uh, with the end of the three decades long rule of one man and one party in Montenegro that was burdened with corruption 
state capture, organized crime, and so on. Uh, church provided a rallying point for the opposition that was at the time lost. Uh, and, and they were going for another uh, defeat, the elections, but uh, as, as I said, the church protest uh, mobilized and, and motivated people to vote against the government. And uh, Serbia and Russia uh, are... The, the whole process, uh, as I said, the COVID pandemics, the economic crisis that, that, were, that followed gave way to Serbia and Russia to lock, lock in their long-awaited profits in Montenegro. Uh, I'll use this time to, to, to say a few words about the Russian and Serbian influence, but I think that Ivana will say more about Russian influence in, in Montenegro and the Balkans. But Russoph Russophilia is not a new phenomenon in Montenegro. It has been act it acted as, as a protector of Orthodox peoples in the Balkans since the Ottoman times and, and uh, after the emergence of their regional and global appetites, they were back. And in 2016, they sponsored the cartoonish coup attempt. Uh, and uh, they learned some lessons uh, after that. And then they were keeping low profile in the past couple of years and mostly using Serbia as their proxy to influence politics in Montenegro. They're using uh, soft power. They're learning fast. They're, they're using uh, public diplomacy. They're bringing journalists to Moscow and even to Grozny. Uh, they're organizing media in Montenegro, roundtables that, that resemble this one that we're taking part in right now. And, and uh, Serbia is doing the same especially playing with the identity politics in Montenegro. Uh, as you may know that Montenegro is, is a bit different than the other Balkan states because there is no clear ethnic line between the communities, when, especially when it comes to Serbian and Montenegrin community in Montenegro. Um, unlike Croatia, Bosnia and Kosovo, where you have uh, different, uh, where you have clear lines between communities in Montenegro, uh, this distinction goes within the within families, including mine. So almost in every single family, you have you have people that are identifying themselves either as Montenegrins and Serbs. So uh, Serbian Orthodox Church, as I said, locked in in, in their profits, and then they've handpicked some of the key persons in the new government, and they're influencing the politics in, in Montenegro. Uh, they're introducing some of the policies that are important for them strategically, and they're uh, working parallel with the Serbian government, uh, the law on citizenship and residence. Uh, they're trying to gerrymander ethnically uh, the future election results in Montenegro by uh, allowing uh, Serbian refugees that are mostly Ser ethnic Serbs from the region uh, to obtain uh, more easily Serbian Montenegrin citizenship, and, and they're trying to block are diaspora from voting, people that are mostly Bosniak and Albanians. Uh, they're trying to uh, introduce gradually uh, the, the religious curriculum uh, within the uh, within the school, official school cur curriculum in Montenegro. And, and what is more disturbing is that not only political scene is changing in Montenegro, the social fabric uh, in Montenegro is, is changing the demographics. Uh, people who have been radicalized religiously, the, the, it's, it, the, the numbers are growing by many of the research that were undertaken in Montenegro. Uh, the percentage uh, Lubomir, of those... Lubomir, let's come back to this uh, when when we get done with our presentations. And I mean, this is- yeah, a... Just a second, I just sure. few, just a few words and I'm, I'm finishing. Okay. So uh, the, the percentage of those who consider themselves religious has increased almost 30% since last two years. Percentage of those who perceive themselves on the pro-Serbian side increased at the expense of ambivalent. Uh, the extremes of polarizations are growing. Uh, there is a strong correlation between pro-Serbian identity and COC affiliation. And, and there is an increase in the tendency to equate, uh, equate the national liberation war movement and and, and Chetnik movement, the war. So there is this tendency for the uh, reinterpretation of history during the World War II. So this all uh, is showing that, that uh, the influence from Serbia and Russia and Montenegro okay. is growing and it gives results. Thank you very much. 
Our next speaker is Dr. Leon Hartwell. Uh, he is the acting director of the Transatlantic Leadership Program at the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington, DC. Leon. Thank you so much, Professor Durame, and also to the Harriman Institute for this opportunity. I'm really gl glad to be here. Um, so rather, I think then zooming in on the September border flare up and the brokering of the new sticker regime, I'll give you the 30,000 foot view of the Serbia Kosovo dispute. And I think my starting point is that the EU's Belgrade Pristina dialogue is not going to resolve this dispute, at least not, not under current conditions. Uh, you know, at a theoretical level, the Serbia Kosovo dispute is one of the hardest issues to resolve. Uh, if this was about strictly about resources, there would be about a 70% chance success rate of resolving this dispute. But it's not. It's about sovereignty and security. Um, and, and those issues have a success rate of about 44.7% and 40% respectively. And when I'm using the word success, I'm really setting the bar really low because it's defined as a reduction in violence or brokering of an agreement. I think most of you will know that in terms of the Serbia-Kosovo uh, dialogue, the EU already uh, brokered uh, uh, over 30 agreements. And if I look at other situations that are comparable to the Serbia-Kosovo dispute, agreements only have an implementation rate of about uh, 30%. So, um, so uh, you know, at least at a theoretical level, this is a very difficult issue to resolve. Now, I'm going to turn more uh, also in terms to a few current trends that I've that I've uh, recognised. I'll only zoom in on a few. Um, you know, mediation has its limits. It's like herding cats, and those of you who know anything about cats is that they have independent minds. Um, so we need to turn to the adversaries, uh, first and foremost, especially Serbia. And it's not that I want to, uh, you know, uh, beat up on, on Serbia, but it is the dominant player in this dispute because it has to do with sovereignty. Um, and the main catch here, uh, if we're talking about cats, would be President uh, Vucic. Uh, he is the dominant player in terms of this dialogue, undoubtedly a strong support. Uh, in, in the Serbian parliament, but he also controls the narrative. And I would argue is not just a thermometer reflecting the public mood. He's also a thermostat leader. So he sets the agenda. Um, and what's interesting, if you look at President Vucic, especially over the last two years, his language has uh, you know, changed quite, quite a lot from somewhat reconciliatory language to much more aggressive language. I think one thing that is quite disturbing to me uh, over the last few weeks is there's been this resurgence of this idea of the Serb world, which I, I think is indistinguishable from uh, greater Serbia. Um, I think also beyond his language, uh, his actions have been more militant, which has been the, what we've seen at the border in September with all those uh, uh, tanks, uh, mostly Russian tanks. Uh, um, you know, so um, Serbia's defense budget has also doubled uh, from 2018, from 700 million euros in 2018 to about 1.5 billion this year. That's a massive increase in terms of its military spending. Uh, Russia also, I would argue, emboldened Serbia's action, as we've seen with the Russia's ambassadors, a presence at the border a few weeks ago um, and some of the statements coming out of Moscow. And meanwhile, I think the, the Western reactions to the border flare-up um, you know, have been quite disappointing. Uh, the EU, the US and NATO all used language that both sides needed to de-escalate the, 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 the conflict, even though I would argue Serbia and Kosovo were not equally responsible for, for escalating the dispute. Um, then, uh, you know, I think one of the key issues for me is that uh, the, the EU, US and NATO should have been more firm in calling out President Vucic. You know, um, they say if you keep on throwing steaks at a tiger, it's not going to turn it into a vegetarian. So um, I, I do think we need to be more firm in terms of our approach. Um, 
I didn't pay much attention to Kosovo here, just simply because I think the room for maneuver there is much smaller. But I'd be happy to talk to talk about it in the Q and A. The the overall result here is that the adversaries are um, at an impasse. In terms of the EU, the EU on paper looks really strong as a mediator. You know, Serbia benefits a lot from the EU. Seventy percent of Serbia's exports are destined for EU markets. The EU also contributes about 70% of Serbia's uh, foreign direct investment, and it uh, provides a lot of development support uh, for Serbia in the lead up to uh, EU possible EU membership. Um, in practice, though, the EU is weak because it's divided because of the five non-recognizers, but also the EU players that facilitate this role. So it's not setting the agenda. It's simply you know, providing a forum for the parties to to, uh, uh, to talk. And I think because of the divisions within the EU, it leads to some form of policy paralysis. Um, the EU enlargement carrot is also um, um, rapidly diminishing because of enlargement fatigue and also because Serbia is less serious about joining uh, the, the EU, I would argue. Um, so to conclude, I don't want to go over my time, um, but um, I think we need to recognize that the belgrade Pristina dialogue is not working. And I think only then, if we recognize that, can we start to come up with alternative solutions. I'd be happy to talk about some of those during the Q&A. Thank you so much, Professor Duomi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm our next speaker and also the first uh, reporter that I've brought to the round table uh, at the first time since I've been holding these. and. It, it could not be a better person or journalist, and that is Basil Lucci, who is the co-founder and chief editor of Kosovo 2.0. It's a fantastic platform. It publishes in Albanian, English, and BCS, and they carry out some really great analysis presenting the entire region as well. So over to you, Besa. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tanya, for that, uh, for that presentation. And thank you also for, for having me. So I'm going to quickly turn to talking about commenting on Kosovo's uh, new government and its current position on the relationship with, uh, with Serbia and kind of what we can expect uh, coming up ahead. And I think at, at this stage, I think we're pretty much aware that uh, Albin Kutis of Endosia has, uh, through the landslide victory that they won uh, elections with in February, uh, together with our coalition partner, partner they've really managed to they managed to be now in a position with a high degree of public trust and also with a strong electoral legitimacy, which I think is also affecting their approach to the uh, to the dialogue. But also at the same time, this is not Putin's first time as prime minister, and he's not an unknown political uh, figure. And he's partic particularly when it comes to the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, he's built much of his political uh, figure in opposition for almost 20, 30 years now, in the, and in the past 10 years uh, of the Kosovo-Serbia dialogue, uh, he has been a fierce opponent of it, and also by refuting it in its um, entirety. So without doubt, there's always been this uh, level of anticipation of what would Kuti in a leadership position uh, bring, and how he would, whether whether the rhetoric and the discourse that he's held over the years, whether that he would uh, uh, respect that, also in a position of the prime minister, and we got to we got a bit of a taste of that, I think, last year also when he was in uh, in government for a short-lived time, so for only 50, uh, 50 days. But even last year, I think uh, when as prime minister, we immediately saw that he was more resistant to international pressures, uh, especially at that time, it was with regard to the 100% uh, tariff uh, that his, his predecessor had uh, put on Serbian uh, goods. So he was trying, he was not caving into these kind of, uh, into, uh, into these pressures, but also at the same time, uh, uh, he took at the time uh, steps to, to change Kosovo's strategy in the dialogue by trying to take away control uh, from then uh, President uh, Hashim, uh, Hashim Slavci, and especially since at that time, it was a time when the whole agreement on the potential land swap was being discussed, and as well as the uh, interference of uh, uh, the interference of, uh, of Grenoble. But that was a short-lived government, and this and, and now this year when uh, they came to power together with uh, uh, with Yosal Swani, who is now also president, uh, they they enjoy this overall, I think, legitimacy, which 
can be good and, prob and problematic, but there's no time to go into that for now. But I think what it's interesting is that they're, that they're speaking also in the same uh, way, in some, to some extent in the same voice, and they're very much aligned when it comes to Kosovo's position to, uh, towards Serbia in the, in the dialogue. So on one hand, you have, you can say that you have a stable government with uh, aligned institutions that have, uh, uh, that have the, the share the approach in, in the dialogue, but not necessarily their approach is what the EU wants. In, in, in this case, I would say. So what I think that uh, the two of them have been doing uh, since February is that they're really kind of looking to shift this long-standing approach to the dialogue by insisting that the dialogue should should only proceed if it's built upon a foundation that recognizes both parties as equals and that uh, a compromise shouldn't be an expectation only from the Kosovo uh, Kosovo side, Kos side. For example, Osmani, like she, she has stated in this regard that Kosovo has already made the compromise by just joining uh, the, the dialogue, which are kind of statements that we have not heard previously from, from previous political uh, or state leaders. And meanwhile, by this point, uh, Putin has ingrained in public discourse the phrase that Kosovo has been more of a topic in the dialogue than a party to a dialogue, and that has to change. So he has made it very clear that he wants the, the talks to take place under conditions of reciprocity and the goal of mutual recognition and with a different kind of insistence, I think, that we've seen from others engaged in the, uh, in the dialogue. But of course, the time of testing really came when the, when the talks commenced at the beginning of, a, uh, of the summer. So there were in the two talks, one in June and one in, in, one in July between the uh, EU high representative and between President Vucic and uh, Prime Minister uh, Putin, it was very clear that everybody had entered the, the talk with uh, with a different idea of what was uh, expected. For Vucic, Vucic, it was, of course, the uh, association of Serb majority municipalities, uh, of the, of the establishment of the association. Uh, for Brussels, it's mainly uh, to make, to insist that, uh, that governments, that they need to the, it, okay, I'm running out of time. It's to insist on the respect of past the past agreement, but for Putin was really to start, I think, shifting the, the narrative over the dialogue. And I think this is what we saw uh, with the license page, because to the extent, because he uh, his uh, insistence on uh, reforming the dialogue or, or, or changing the narrative of the dialogue, of course, is not going to be expected by, it's not expected by the EU and uh, by Serbia. He's going to try to use uh, different avenues and different ways uh, to, to shift that. And I think this is ultimately what he tried to do, uh, as well as with the license plate uh, issue, uh, by also, and specifically by picking up agreements that also show just how unequal of a footing two parties have had in the dialogue throughout this entire a time. It's a, it's a good way to also continue to gather support uh, uh, domestically, but also to point to the flaws uh, of the uh, of the dialogue itself. And I, for the end, I can I think that we're going to continue to see him engaging with, with potentially in similar in in, uh, in similar decisions. So going back to agreements and seeing whether there's potential gaps and loopholes through which then the dialogue can be uh, uh, can be challenged and through which he uh, can contribute not. To, to disturbing in a way the status quo, quo and sending across uh, his message for, for a different uh, kind of framework for the, uh, for the dialogue. Thank you so much, Besa. Our, our next uh, speaker is Nikola Barazer and he actually is a, the program director at the Belgrade based Center for Contemporary Politics and the executive ed editor of another fantastic uh, Balkan media platform, the European Western Balkans. Um, he's going to weigh in on this discussion. Nicola, you have the microphone. Well, thank you very much, Tanya, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, now, it is uh, definitely true that the Western Balkans region is in turmoil in a way that it is uh, definitely ripe with different uh, problems arising in the in the last few months, but I would also say in the last several years. And I would say the two underlying reasons for this are, first of all, this prevalence of nationalist narratives, which are remain prevalent in the region. Some of them stem from the 90s conflict, but some actually have been reinvigorated in recent years. And the second problem is prevalence of authoritarian or semi-authoritarian populist regimes uh, in the region. And these two 
uh, phenomena have been reinforcing also because you see uh, populist leaders who are all, always playing on the nationalist card because this is the way how they remain in power, this is how they remain credible. And on the other hand, uh, the, the ethnic problems, the ethnic uh, unresolved ethnic conflict which exists in the region are definitely favorable for the emergence of these uh, populist uh, leaders who are allegedly able to resolve them, but this is obviously uh, not happening. Uh, you know, the EU is a very important actor in that uh, regard. Uh, through this uh, so-called policy of stabilitocracy, the EU has basically favored uh, uh, stability over democracy, which means resolving these ethnic conflicts, being aligned with uh, EU's own uh, foreign policy interests, completely disregarding the state of democracy in the Western Balkan countries, leaving it to be resolved at some point uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, the most famous example of this, of course, is, is Serbia, where we, we know that President Fucic has been basically tolerated uh, for a long time by his uh, European Union uh, partners in the sense that they have been more reliant to him when it comes to rule of law and lack of democracy in Serbia because of the belief that he will resolve the issue of Kosovo, that he will strike a deal with, with the Kosovo leaders, but this is obviously not happening. There are also other examples uh, or were other examples in the past, like Milo Djukanovic, who was favored by the West because of his foreign policy stance, disregarding some elements of state capture within the country itself. We had Gruevsky earlier, who was looked upon favorable because of alignment on the immigration crisis, etc. So there are numerous examples of this, and you could say it it has been a consistent EU policy for the for the region. Uh, in the last several years. But now we see EU a bit absent from the region. We see it uh, having a lot less impact. We see this perspective being a lot less clear than it used to be several years ago. And now this complicates things uh, a lot. Now here, I want to mention briefly my position on this issue of uh, external actors, of how dangerous they are, how impactful they are. Uh, my opinion is that these actors are basically filling the gaps left by the EU and, uh, and the Western powers. Uh, they are invited and welcomed by the local elites. They are needed by the local elites for their own, uh, for their own interests. Of course, Russia has its own interest in the region, which is destabilizing the region, preventing enlargement of EU and NATO in the region. China has its economic interests, but the local elites are those who actually uh, benefit the most from these connections, and they're doing everything they can to make these partnerships stronger and also to make them more popular. And I'm, I'm primarily here talking about Serbia as the most important partner of both Russia and China. You can see actually Serbian leaders who are promoting this partnership uh, through their uh, narratives. Uh, they have been very strong pro-Chinese narratives the last couple of years, especially since the pandemic began. And pro-government media outlets are the main instruments of pro-Russian, pro-Chinese, and anti-Western propaganda in the country by far. So even without Sputnik existing at all uh, in, in Serbia and the region, you would have strong pro-Russian propaganda coming from, from, the, from the Serbian media. The reasons for this are a bit complex, but it could be said that uh, uh, Serbian political elites, or let's say President Vucic, has, has uh, basically a lot to gain by presenting himself to his own voters as being pro-Russian and also by uh, pushing these anti-EU narratives, blunting criticism coming from Brussels and EU member states capitals. Uh, when it comes to the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, uh, it had definitely hit a roadblock. Uh, and the reason for this is quite simple. The dialogue has always been in a way connected to the EU enlargement process. Uh, the governments have striked the deals uh, because of promises given by the EU. So every major step that both Serbia and Kosovo did on their way towards the EU so far has, has some connection with an agreement reached in Brussels from uh, getting candidate status, opening the first chapters, opening negotiations, Kosovo getting an SAA, et cetera, et cetera. And now we can see basically that this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of perspective is, is not as clear as it used to be, and uh, both the governments are aware of it. And this is why we maybe see a lack of implementation of all these agreements and why the dialogue has uh, hit, uh, uh, hit the roadblock. Now, the Serbian government needs to at least theoretically pretend that it wants to strike a compromise because of the aforementioned policy of support coming from several EU member states capital because of the readiness to, 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 uh, to deal with Pristina. But now uh, we can see in Kosovo that Kurti's government is uh, quite openly uh, basically rejecting some of these deals uh, which were striked in Brussels even seven, eight uh, uh, years ago and have no, have no will for compromise. And this is now uh, a dangerous problem because, uh, as I said, the EU's perspective is uh, is lacking, and it's quite unclear what can the EU do to pressure or to revolt both sides to uh, to go further in the dialogue 
and to and to actually reach this comprehensive normalization, which is expected at the end of the process. And Nika, uh, Nicola, we need to wrap that up. Sorry. Uh, going to my watch. No, exactly. I have like 20 seconds. Okay. okay so uh, <laughs> not to go any more deeper into this, uh, let's just say that uh, Serbia uh, Serbia faces uh, uh, very strong authoritarian tendencies. And these nationalist narratives are quite prevalent in the country, but I would say they're mostly directed to the inside. They are actually done in a way to radicalize the Serbian population and to basically prolong Vucic's own rule. And what do we have end with this policy of stereotocracy done by the EU? Well, we have no resolution to ethnic conflicts, we have no stability, we have no democracy, and we have no EU accession. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Ivana Stradner who is uh, the Jean Kirkpatrick Visiting Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And she broadly focuses on cybersecurity and Russian hybrid wealth warfare. And she's going to talk about that and how it operates in the Balkans. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you very much, Tanya, for organizing um, this event. Um, I always like to say that uh, the Balkans has not been on the US agenda for more than two decades. And the most recent headlines in the West have been filled with the news from the region, uh, which is actually never a good thing. And uh, I'm also very pleased to see this event and uh, because I oftentimes, you know, here in Washington DC, I know Russia is a poor state with numerous demographic problems. It's not a serious threat. Um, and although Russia is uh, proud of its conventional military capabilities, it is not a conventional military near peer to the US and I agree with that, but it does not matter. And this is why, if you read carefully Russia's latest national security strategy from uh, June 2021, you will find that this document for the first time emphasizes information security. And uh, Russia understands that it can successfully win against the West using hybrid warfare. Uh, if you, for example, read carefully also Russia's military strategies that argue that information superiority and anticipatory operations will be the main ingredients of success in a new generation wars. And one thing that one more thing that I would like to emphasize before I move on the Balkans to understand how Russia has been waging um, information operations over there, I would like to emphasize also that the chief of staff of the Russian military, Valery Gerasimov, stated that the ratio of non-military to military measures is four to one. This is all you really need to know to understand how Russia has been successfully waging uh, hybrid warfare um, in Eastern Europe um, more broadly. So the Balkans is actually among many theaters you know, of con confrontation between uh, Russia and the West. Um, and Russia's goals in the Balkans are very much aligned with Putin's global goals that actually include to end American dominance and the unipolar order and to establish Russia as a global power. Um, Russia also identifies NATO as an adversary and a threat. And Russia really wants to challenge Article 5. Uh, Russia would also like to break the Western unity and weaken the EU. So. The above mentioned goals, like they perfectly fits, you know, the Russia's actions also in the Balkans. I mean, the list of examples is very, very long. So uh, because I've been monitoring events in the region carefully um, and I, I, I'm going to just use a few of them to um, explain like what Russia has been doing in the region. Um, for example, energy is really number one thing uh, and Russia's number one goal in the region. And given the most recent crisis uh, in Europe, the one that Ivana mentioned, uh, we need to pay more attention to Russia's energy actions in the Balkans. Uh, Russia is using gas to develop its sphere of influence in the Balkans. And actually also this week in President Vucic emphasized during its media conference with Russia's Minister of Foreign Affairs Lavrov, that gas is actually really number one thing in security. 
Russia also invests in critical infrastructures. And again, energy is extremely important here. It also, Russia uses information space, such as propaganda, cyber activities. Russia has established numerous Russia-friendly media in the region in order to spread propaganda. Russia used domestic media to polarize region. Uh, internally, uh, for example, I monitor information space during the Kosovo and Montenegro crisis recently, and information space was filled with fake news and was very polluted. Uh, Russia also used uh, differential factories, and we should all just remember the one that exists uh, in North Macedonia, the one that was responsible for uh, the fake news uh, disinformation operations during the US elections. Russia also wages cultural wars in the region, and the Russian Orthodox Church is an important influence tool. Uh, the perfect example is, again, Montenegro, which is a NATO member state, and um, and Russia supported, and, and Montenegro, sorry, supported economic and diplomatic sanction against Moscow. And we all hoped, you know, that the country was on the right path, but what we have actually been able to observe over the past one year is that corruption in the government and new polarization between you know, the president and the government further allow Russia to polarize the country. And this is where actually uh, religious division uh, is important because Russia wants to assert itself as a protector of the Serbs and guardian of the Orthodox faith. And now Russia employs the same strategy it once actually used in Ukraine to stop religious and ethnic tensions. Um, it's needless to say about political ties in, in Serbia, Montenegro, North Macedonia. Um, Serbia, Russia is also uh, arming the region. Um, a few people already mentioned that. Uh, for example, while we are talking today, Russia has another military flight tactical exercise with Serbia. Uh, and Moscow has been arming the region and Serbia specifically. Um, it has provided security assistance for Republika Srpska. Um, there is also another upcoming uh, very, very important military exercise between Russia and Serbia. Uh, a yearly exercise, for example, that was canceled because of the pandemic last year, but a year before that, Russia installed S-400 for a military exercise. And Russia already promised a new panzer system for this year military exercise. So we'll see what is on the horizon. Uh, needless to say also that Russia has so-called humanitarian center located uh, in Nish, which is strategically important because of Kosovo. Um, as per Bosnia Herzegovina, I, I, I invite you to read my paper co-author with Tanya, uh, because we wrote uh, a piece that we're, in which we explained and actually that Russia, driven by EU and NATO related insecurities, is talking actually ethnic tensions in the region, and Republika Srpska is of special interest to Moscow, given that Milora Dodik has been calling for secessionist movements for a very long time, which is precisely what Russia wants in order to destabilize further the region. I mean, Putin is a very, very uh, opportunistic leader uh, whose main goal is really to disrupt uh, the region. I do not have any evidence that Russia was directly involved in the most recent Kosovo-Serbia border crisis, uh, but I would absolutely agree with uh, a few people who mentioned this, that, uh, that the Kremlin actually benefits from status quo. Uh, the Kosovo crisis showed that Moscow skillfully profits from the conflicts in the Balkans with neighboring countries. And I actually foresee Moscow will continue to provoke existing hostilities. And finally, I would like to uh, ask a question. Why should the West even care about the Balkans? Um, Russia poses, I think, significant threat to the West, and it's questionable whether the West is ready to respond. Russia is effective because the West is actually weak. And this is exactly what we also see in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, the US is pursuing isolationist politics, and we should not be surprised to see that, Balk that the Balkans is actually is not a uh, US priority. However, the EU should pay more attention because ignoring the region will definitely cost the EU more. And I'm happy to discuss. Uh, all Thank this. you, Ivana. That was very, that was excellent. Um, so our last speaker and a uh, great colleague of mine, uh, Tina Prelick, is a research fellow at the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Oxford. Um, she has done considerable work 
on corruption throughout the region. That's how she and I met one another. And she is currently a fellow also at the University of Rijeka. Um, you have the floor, Tina. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Tanya, for the invitation and for giving me the word. I was trying to paste uh, some uh, works on uh, the Balkans in China, but I think there might be some Russian presence here. I'm unable to copy paste them. Really? So, uh, <laughs> really? So I'll, I, will do, I will do so later. Um, I will tell you uh, just a few overarching points about uh, the Chinese presence in the Balkans in the interest of time, and then pass on to to highlighting what I think is really the elephant in the room in this topic. Uh, so first of all, the Chinese presence in the Balkans has been on the up. Um, the amount of the financial flows coming from China uh, to the Balkans, including loans, but not only, there are also some greenhouse investments, has, con has increased considerably uh, in the second half of the 2010s. Uh, so that uh, statement by former commissioner Johannes Hahn former commissioner on enlargement, that the EU has overestimated Russia and underestimated China in the Balkans indeed rings true. Uh, now, the, um, the presence of China in the Balkans happens uh, within the frame of the 17 plus one initiative, which is in itself an emanation of the larger uh, foreign policy goal of the China's Belt and Road initiative. Uh, and yet, it's also important to highlight that um, uh, this uh, relation is fueled also by bilateral relations. And you can see that because uh, although recently um, the 17 plus one uh, framework has had some bumps in the road, nevertheless, um, this has not weakened the collaboration of China with selected, um, uh, with selected uh, uh, countries of the Western Balkans. So this tells you that really there is a, a more bilateral type of approach that China um, molds its approach from country to country, and that the relationship between uh, the political leaderships are very, very important. The second point is that uh, China's involvement until recently uh, was seen as purely economic. Um, so the narrative was very much focused on the mutual economic benefit between uh, the Western Balkan countries and uh, China uh, itself. And this was front and center in all the way that um, uh, the media, both in the Western Balkans and in China, presented this uh, relationship. And yet, um, in a way, you know, we should not be surprised that uh, this is not the case any longer. I mean, China's presence in the Balkans has never been purely economic. Um, there is this interesting uh, case from some time ago uh, in which um, China has blocked, has vetoed uh, the deployment of UN forces in Macedonia during its uh, security crisis in 1999. And uh, surprise, surprise, North Macedonia at that point was the only country in the region maintaining official diplomatic relations with Taiwan. So we can see that there was no relations, no economic also exchange between China and, uh, and uh, North Macedonia between 99 and 2001. And then North Macedonia changed its policy to the one China policy, basically, um, unrecognizing uh, Taiwan, and they started uh, um, uh, started uh, having uh, economic relations again. So this tells you, you know, that there was always sort of this long game that China is playing in the Balkans, that is not only and purely economic. And this has been really exposed during the pandemic. Um, first, uh, in the first phase uh, through the so-called mask diplomacy, and the second case through a so-called vaccine diplomacy. Uh, we saw the scenes of, you know, President Vucic welcoming uh, uh, the Chinese help uh, by kissing the Chinese flag, speaking in Chinese, uh, thanking Brother C, uh, the big billboards in Belgrade and elsewhere in the region, also some overtures towards China. Uh, so really, you know, there is this uh, increasing, let's say, sort of uh, also feeling um, in, um, uh, among the populations that China is, uh, is the friend. And yet, what is uh, very, very important here? Uh, the important part is that uh, the way that this uh, uh, image is propagated is indeed through 
the uh, media that are uh, that are controlled most of all by the ruling elites. So this message that the China and also other external actors propagate really is taken and highlighted through um, the, the local media. And there is this chapter that uh, Nicolaus Tsipakis and I have uh, written for the Italian think tank ISPI that analyzes over 300 articles of uh, Serbian tabloids that basically uh, unpacks that. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, the place where, where this strategy has had the most of uh, the, the biggest echo is uh, Serbia. Uh, so I'll give you just a few uh, data from a very recent Ipsos survey uh, conducted by the Balkans in Europe uh, Policy Advisory Group that really show how Serbia is becoming an outlier uh, in these geopolitical terms, uh, if nothing else. So in the vast majority of countries, in spite of this disillusionment with the EU as a reliable partner that has been kind of monopolizing um, also media attention recently and of which many of you have, uh, have talked about. So in spite of this uh, sort of EU accession crisis, in the majority of uh, Western Balkan countries are still inclined towards uh, um, EU accession. Uh, and yet uh, the one exception of this uh, is uh, Serbia where this preference is not so marked. So it's still, there's people are still in favor of EU accession, but not so much. And uh, quite um, worryingly, almost half of Serbia think that uh, EU accession will never happen. Furthermore, in terms of vaccines, you have uh, Pfizer, which is the favorite vaccine almost everywhere, except in Serbia where it's Sinopharm. So quite clearly this vaccine diplomacy by China has worked. So, you know, the, uh, the point here is that uh, the influence of China could not happen without the local elites, not only through the media, but indeed through giving um, the possibility to China to engage in deals that are very controversial and that are indeed in very ca that many cases marred at least by environmental damage. We've seen that in Bor, in Smederevo, in Tuzla, in Bosnia and in other places and uh, with a big uh, um, uh, opportunities for rent-seeking practices for corruption. And this is what it's called the so-called corrosive capital, meaning um, flows of money that enter uh, a situation where the rule of law is weak and make it even weaker. Um, but uh, I mean, just to, to conclude, uh, I mean, in, in another country, just not to focus completely on Serbia and touching upon Bosnia, uh, in Montenegro, we have the situation in which it was the, um, the debt trap uh, surrounding the highway deal that was what was most talked about in the media. Uh, yes. But there is this other really interesting investigation, if I manage, I'll, I'll link it to you, which basically explains how much now something that is now a Chinese owned project uh, was. Uh, um, uh, something that was heralded as an EU investment and was at the end um, con uh, concluded on very unfavorable terms for Montenegrin taxpayers who are forced to buy wind electricity three times the market price and was ushered through, of course, by the ruling elites uh, and uh, helped uh, by the, the former ruling elite in, in Montenegro. So to conclude, the, influ the influence of external actors really is only as strong as the ruling elites who invite them. And uh, furthermore, it's important to note, as Nicola also mentioned earlier, that the increasing authoritarian tendencies, and I would say kleptocratic tendencies in the Balkans, are indeed favoring this, uh, uh, this presence. Back to you, Tanya. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions before we go to the audience. Um, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Tina, about UAE. UAE has invested quite a bit of money in Serbia. I know, I again, I don't want to beat up on Serbia, but this is in terms of investments uh, in the waterfront and also their partnership in Serbia Air. And uh, can you just talk about that for a minute, your thoughts on that and maybe what, what the upshot there is in terms of is it more than money? What, what's going on here? 
Sure. So, uh, yes, again, the influence of the United Arab Emirates has been discussed mainly in relation with Serbia because, indeed, the economic relations have been most marked there. Um, the um, Outwardly, uh, the story is, again, one of mutual economic benefit. Uh, the Emirates, and with this I mean specifically Abu Dhabi, the most, uh, um, the richest Emirate in, the, um, in the, the UAE, has focused on four strategic sectors that bring um, benefit to them on construction, on agriculture, so food security, on defense, and on airlines. So rationally, the story holds. And yet, these deals have been <clears throat> massively con controversial. And there have been uh, some journalistic investigations that have showed in a very reliable way that they have been marred by corruption. But again, where did this start? It's interesting to note that uh, it did not start the cooperation uh, between you know, the Emirates and the Balkans in this more recent era. Actually started back in 2008 uh, in Montenegro where the first embassy in the Balkans was, uh, was set up and then passed on to Serbia. And in many ways, the actors that facilitate these deals are very much the same. So Mohamed Dahlan uh, was uh, um, somebody who is, uh, who is touted as uh, the broker of, uh, of some of these deals. He's been given both Serbian and Montenegrin citizenship. The ambassador to Abu Dhabi was a longstanding business partner and also personal friend of Mira Djukanovic. Her name is actually quite prominently uh, quoted in a lot of Italian prosecution documents where they were, when they were investigating Djukanovic for cigarette smuggling. And then um, we saw that, you know, that this, uh, this prosecution was, was stopped. And we had recently the the statements by uh, high uh, officials of the US saying that in that period, the US was actually shielding Dukhanovic. So what does that tell you? That tells you also that this purported clash between Montenegro and Serbia that is being discussed today is much more complex than it is presented at first sight. And if it, all this not, was not enough, we had the Pandora Papers recently, which exposed the very, very troubling issues, both in the very heart of the Serbian and of the Montenegrin uh, highest officials. So uh, in my view, uh, the attempt to present the DPS as a lesser evil in Montenegro, uh, so Milo Djukanovic's party, is ultimately outright, outright reputation laundering and an enabling of kleptocracy. Thank you. Um, Ivana uh, Stradner, I want to ask you a question. Um, Russia does not have the cash power of China. It doesn't even come close. Russia's economy is the size of Italian, the Italian economy. Um, and it's, you know, it's not diverse either. It's just based on gas and oil cells. Um, but so if they don't have the cash power of China, how does Serbia benefit from this apparently very, very close partnership with Russia? Can you give us some takeaways on what you think in terms of that partnership and who gets what from whom? Yeah, that's a very, very important actually um, question, even though the answer uh, might actually even ask more questions than pro to provide mm -hmm. uh, the answers. Because I think we should, we should look at this question from both ways. Like on one side, how does Serbia benefit from close partnership with Russia, but also how does Russia benefit from Serbia? Mm -hmm. um, to answer the first question, um, Russia's investments actually have increased over the past one year. And this is exactly what President Vucic also mentioned um, this weekend uh, during the media conference with uh, Lavrov. And it doesn't even matter uh, how much Russia invests because Russia invests in critical sectors. Russia invests in gas and Russia also invests in military. Uh, but um, I think it's in order actually to answer your question, I need to emphasize that Vucic seeks to retain control of Serbia and his succession. In order to remain in power, Vucic is actually waging the politics of neutrality. So no wonder why Serbia organized a non-online movement uh, this weekend. Um, and Vucic has personal affinity, I think, for Russia, given you know, his rhetorics and actions from the past. But President Vucic is also a very rational and opportunistic leader whose main goal is really to remain in power. And Russia is important for Vucic as a leverage to negotiate with the West, to accomplish 
is her goal, which is actually to stay in power. But again, we really need to also ask this question, even more important question as to how Russia benefits from Serbia. And that's actually to accomplish its main goals that include like breaking the Western unity and weakening the European Union. And the real question in, in, in and the real question I think that we should also um, ask is, what is the Serbia's leverage with Russia and how much maneuver Serbia actually has uh, when deciding whether or not or to obey, to obey Russia's uh, demands? Thank you very much. So I wanna to go to you, Kurt. Um, and I know that this is a topic that all the Europeans on this panel I'm sure have discussed, but Specifically, we have a new government being formed in Berlin. It looks like it's going to be an SPD coalition, led coalition. And I want to ask you, I know this is conjecture, but I don't really know uh, what SPD's foreign policy has been. They haven't been in power really in a long time. And so how is that going to affect um, the role of the high representative in Bosnia and Herzegovina. There's a lot of skin in this game here. And uh, Mr. Sh uh, Schmidt came from CDU. Uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. And then in terms of a broader question, and, and I would like to solicit comments from um, all of you, just raise your hand on this, about the role of Germany in the Balkans and what kind of uh, leadership are we going to see? Because Merkel has essentially left. Uh, she's, she's been a lame duck for two years, which I think is a horrible way to say goodbye to somebody, make them nearly impotent before they go. Um, but Germany has been the major player on the continent. They're the richest country. They, have, they are allegedly the most powerful. And now we're having a change. And how is that going to affect specifically my question to you on BIH? But more broadly, I'd like to hear comments from those of you who want to answer this question. Kurt. Yeah, well, thank you, Tanya. I mean, part of the Western disunity that we, you know, has characterized, I think, everybody's answers. Uh, we got wrong footed even before Biden was inaugurated. I mean, Schmidt was 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 mm -hmm. formally nominated the day Biden got inaugurated, which yes. sort of telegraphed Western disunity. Whatever the logic of appointing him and whatever the, the strategy, and it's clear that there wasn't one. I think that's become evident. Um, uh, it's it remains to be seen. I mean, the SPD. I mean, the the, the SPD Spitzen kind of that. Uh, had 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 made Olaf Scholz had made some worrying comments about the EU and Russia. At the same time, you've had really the only outlier on dealing with things like Nord Stream Two was were the Greens. You know, the Greens want energy independence, which means you have a you have a stronger position to to deal with with Russia, but also just on values altogether. So I think the permutation of the coalition dynamics is going to be really important. Uh, there is potential for change, particularly on uh, recalibrating the European Union on how it approaches enlargement, because it's been, it's been a zombie policy for a long time. It's been, it's been wandering forward. The main, the main, the prime directive seems to be don't admit failure. Let's, let's come up with something that could constitute a deliverable to demonstrate success, or at least to demonstrate it's not failed yet. Um, so uh, I, think, I think that's going to, the, the Greens were the only one, you know, were very clear about the Western Balkans in their program. SPD didn't have anything. There are SPD people who do get the region in parliament in the Bundestag who are, who are, who are quite sharp. Uh, so I think there's, there's an opportunity for a reset from a policy that, that has not been strategic or forward looking and the relationship with Paris is going to matter a lot because I think there is more of a likelihood of, 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 of reconstituting a values agenda within the European Union, which 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 Berlin stiffed Paris on uh, when Macron when approached her about that. Um, I mean, so the, the, uh, I think that there's there is a real opportunity here. 
Germany has, I mean, after Brexit, we've seen the effect. Britain's had an outsized leverage in the Balkans, but now it's sort of flailing. Uh, so you have a rudderless Western policy. The Americans have sort of kept on keeping on. Germany intervened with on a, at a higher level than it than it usually did, but without any idea of what they wanted to do with that that leverage in in in, in the high representative appointment. Um, getting getting you know resistance from the Russians and the and the RS. Uh, you uh, you do, so you the reconstitution of the German policy is going to be the first step, I think, in, in an attempt that I had hoped would come from, from our side of the Atlantic in Washington of, of a, a strategic review of how we're approaching the region. Because to, to Ivana Stradner's point, you know, why should we care? If, if the West can't get it together in the Western Balkans where it has more leverage than anywhere else on earth, and I'd say Bosnia in particular on this, but uh, if it cannot have, uh, if it's allowing the Russians and Chinese and others to eat their lunch there and to have our values trampled upon by our partners, then, you know, that sends a message worldwide. And I think people have picked up on that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there and leave okay. it to the others. To, to and anybody on. else want to make some comments on the Germans? Because I know many of you get to go to Berlin and go to some interesting conferences, your ears to the ground on a lot of things that, that I haven't been paying attention to. Um, okay, well, I do want to ask a question. Uh, Ivana Jordanowska. I like having two Ivanas, I mean, it's great. <laughs> um, so I'll just, um, I, I agree with everything that was, that was said so far, but I'll just, I would like to complicate things a little bit. And that is, um, the role of France and um, everything that has been happening. Mm -hmm. uh, France, well, I was, I was going to ask that. So anyway, this is good, fortuitous. Yeah, uh, France was the country that um, blocked uh, North Macedonia and Albania yes. um, in uh, 2019. Yes. And so we, we cannot underestimate the influence that they may have. So mm -hmm. even, uh, you know, even with Germany, and I think that Germany has been, um, at least to North Macedonia, a good partner in many regards. Um, I think that even with, with their push and their support, there hasn't, there, there wasn't a way to overcome um, Fran the, the very destructive veto that France uh, put at that time. Um, and I think that it emboldened Bulgaria Further, not to say that Bulgaria wouldn't have done what it's doing right now without mm -hmm. it, but I think that it gave further um, impetus to Bulgaria to sort of go after. Well, if Greece could do it and they got what they wanted and France mm -hmm. has been doing mm -hmm. it, uh, well, why not us? We're as much an EU member as anyone else. Um, and it's very devastating to see that EU foreign policy boils down to who can veto what. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. That, that was a strategic blow to the region. Uh, Tina, you, you would like to make some comments about France and Germany. Yes, just a few words. So um, I would like to inject a little bit of optimism. Uh, as Kurt said, um, the Greens have been quite vocal um, in a good way about the Balkans, especially in the European Parliament, and especially the German Greens. So in case we have a coalition that, uh, that has uh, German Greens in it, uh, in Germany, I can see uh, perhaps, you know, um, well, more, I'm not saying more constructive because Angela Merkel tried to be constructive in the Balkans, but perhaps more bold, you know, bolder policy towards the Western Balkans uh, from the, the Germany. And this is what my hope would be that uh, more uncompromising on uh, environment and the rule of law. And then about France. So, uh, I mean, even is very right in saying that, uh, uh, you know, Macron's and uh, generally France's uh, blocking on North Macedonia was. Uh, 
was a, a, a very, uh, you know, sad uh, chapter of, of recent EU enlargement story. On the other hand, I would uh, like to reflect on the following. So basically, you know, Emmanuel Macron is somebody who now wants to sort of take over the informal post yeah. of leader of Europe mm -hmm. that has just been vacated yes. by Angela Merkel. And yeah. he has shown uh, to have um, um, willingness to shape the EU enlargement process by pushing for this new uh, EU enlargement methodology. So I'm wondering, you know, if uh, perhaps instead of uh, uh, sort of uh, playing uh, to his uh, uh, domestic policy, which is what everybody expects from him, yeah, that um, he will once again keep uh, uh, sort of the, the situation stalled, uh, not to um, uh, basically um, have, uh, you know, EU enlargement at the center while there were their elections. So I'm wondering whether he might try to um, sort of turn that narrative on its head and present himself as a, a, somebody who is able to broker a deal in the Balkans. So that is my biggest hope that, you know, because it's quite clear that during the Slovenian presidency until the end of the year, nothing is going to happen in terms of uh, um, Bulgaria unblocking uh, um, North Macedonia's EU accession. But perhaps Emmanuel Macron will like to take that role. Uh, that's what I hope. But I completely agree with, uh, um, with uh, Ivana that, uh, uh, you know, this arbitrary blocking is um, the elephant in the room in terms terms of the enlargement process and what's wrong with the, uh, the um, EU side today. And I think that until we don't implement uh, qualified majority voting in the EU, this blocking in one form or another will continue, unfortunately. Thank you. I'm, I'm actually going to bring up the Afghan refugee uh, three countries from the Balkans except uh, Afghan refugees after uh, the very disturbing exit from Afghanistan by the United States. And um, it's people that know me were saying, why are these countries taking people? And I said, well, uh, the reason why is because they're looking for help and support. And um, I would just like to hear some comments from Besa, Akri, and um, Ivana Jordanovska about this. And I actually was emailing with the government point of contact in uh, North Macedonia. And actually, full disclosure, I've been working on getting a family out and I'm still trying to get them out. And so I can honestly say that Eddie Rama probably got the best interview I have ever seen on international television when he was speaking, he was on CNN International saying, well, this is our tradition. We know what that tradition is, Bessa, Bessa, the tradition of Bessa. And uh, I mean, that's the best, best interview he's ever probably given sitting in his, it looked like it was his kitchen, like a regular guy saying, this is our duty. This is our moral obligation. Uh, would you like, Akri, would you like to make some comments about that? Yes. Uh, so I think there are like three main uh, things that eventually uh, led to this decision by Albania. First and foremost is uh, the fact that there is this history behind it of hosting refugees, of hosting people in need. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a tradition of, over there. There is the, 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 the popularity within the, pop the population. There is no... Uh, controversy in terms of hosting refugees. Uh, Mr. The Prime Minister mentioned, has mentioned in various interviews that he had the the, the Jewish refugees during the, the Holocaust mm -hmm. yes, that yes, came yes. to Albania. He mentioned the refugees from Kosovo during the war there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, he mentioned also the, the Iranian dissidents that are already staying in, in Albania after uh, 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 an agreement with the United States. And this br brings me to the second reason, which is the, the fact that the United States was asking for it. It was as a way to, to mm. build that rapport with the US to show that Albania is a trusted partner to the United States and to the West in, in general, and that uh, it is that kind of country that it can uh, assist even, in, even though it's small and it has uh, limited uh, capabilities. The, the last uh, reason I'd say that it's this attitude of Albania, at least in the last mandate of Mr. Rama to try to punch above its uh, weight. So we saw this with the chairmanship of the OSCE, which was in 2020, 
We're seeing this with the upcoming uh, membership of Albania as a non-permanent member in the UN Security Council in 2022-2023. And I think that this is part of the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the, the logic behind the, the decision to host refugees and fleeing from Afghanistan and to show that we can be a force for good and a trusted sure. partner for the West, as I said. Well, when, when uh, Albania accepted all the Kosovo refugees in the United States, I was in Tirana on the day that Madeleine Albright came to speak at the parliament, which was the first time in history an American Secretary of State spoke in the Albanian parliament. And they gave uh, Albania about $13 million. So they, they, uh, they actually funded the uh, open the port, the deep port, uh, and, and then help pave a lot of roads. And so I imagine that the United States will probably provide some assistance for that, for that offer. Uh, what about you, Basa? Do you, uh, what's If I may on? add one, one, one sure. sentence there. Yeah. There, as I said, the, the, the hosting of the refugees have been very popular in Albania, very well accepted by, by the Albanian people. The yes. only thing that's been a little bit controversial has been the, the financial resources that go after it of because course. there has been no, no transparency by the government so far. And the prime minister has insisted that there is no written agreement with the United States so that, that we're not actually getting financial support from the US, which that's remains crazy. open to the, to the idea that who is supporting this. There are some financial, some some organizations that have sure. already declared that they're supporting and uh, which has been accepted by the government, but, but the, at least until now, there is still no, no price tag for the entire thing. And yeah. we'll see. That's the only controversial thing. We'll see about that. Anyway, Besa, what about what's going on in Kosovo? I know how many mm -hmm. refugees were accepted? Uh, I don't remember the exact number yeah. now. It was uh -huh. Yes, and, but it, with regard to what Aktu said, I mean, in terms of the cultural aspect of it, of course, there's a lot of similarities in Albanian culture and hosting sure, sure. Because of our Albanians, the experience, the majority of the population having been refugees themselves. Uh, so in that sense, it was a uh, very much an open discussion. But I do have to say that there was a huge difference in Kosovo because there was no, uh, there was no access. Uh, it was very difficult to have any kind of access in, uh, to information. So while, for example, in Albania, we saw also journalists, media, having access, interviewing, talking to refugees, limited access. Of course, in Kosovo, it's very much uh, uh, shut down because it's been very- Yes, you, you published a really strong report yeah. on the lack of access and they're yeah. in camp bond steals, that correct? Yeah. And, exactly. and no one has access to them. It was a, that report at Kosovo 2.0 is really excellent. Share it in a bit, but I would like to also make uh, make the point in terms of how this whole discussion about the countries in the region accepting uh, refugees has been hap happening, because I, I feel that it's there's a discre discrepancy between this one and also the fact of how over the years, especially through the Balkan route, uh, uh, refugees and migrants have been sure. treated and then also framed. So. Yes. Uh, and I think this is what was missing in this entire discussion and also the role that the EU has played in terms of making the Balkan route what it, uh, what it is, an unsafe route for, for people for refugees, for uh, North Africa or people basically who go through the region to, to, go, to, uh, uh, to go to Western Europe. So yes, there's been acceptance on, right. let's say, this round, but uh, I think we have to be also um, more critical in uh, the debate about just in general about migrants and how they're being treated in Europe in relationship to the Balkan and the Balkan route, I think also deserves- uh, Of course. Uh, yes, I mean, the situation in Bosnia up in Bihać on the Croatian border has been absolutely abysmal. Ivana Tordanoska. Yeah, so um, we did uh, accept, uh, the, the first agreement that was published was that there would be about a thousand uh, refugees coming in from Afghanistan. Um, it, it's not a big number, but the, the problem with this is that um, my connections in the government tell me that until the very last minute that refugees land in the country, a lot of things are uncertain. So we've had cases where flights that were supposed to land in some other countries right. were diverted mid air with hundreds of people on them and then some of them would wow. land in Macedonia. This was happening while people were in the air, uh, which I think is uh, 
highly problematic. So do we know exactly how many are we gonna host? Not, I don't think so. Um, we will have a clear idea as more and more um, as time goes by, but we've already had, um, not officially connected to it, but we've had an increase in the money that USAID will dedicate to Macedonia in the next four to five years from, uh, I believe, eight to 56 million, uh, predominantly uh, to be used in the sphere of uh, fighting corruption um, right. in the country. And there's another aspect which I feel has, hasn't been mentioned in either domestic or international media, and that is that a large number of people from Macedonia have been working for US military contractors in the region, including Afghanistan. And so I think that there is a bit of a different understanding of Afghanistan than what some other countries in Eastern Europe might have, uh, where there is a, a, a difference being made between the Taliban and other Afghanistan and tribes in Afghanistan and so on and so forth. So not to say that there hasn't been any um, xenophobia in the country, but it's very far from the paranoia that we experienced in 2015 during the migration crisis. Sure. Um, there's a question on Turkey, relations with Turkey. Is there anyone here that wants to take that? It's not directed at anybody. I didn't ask anybody to prepare on Turkey. It was anybody Nicola Barazor, you, you're, uh, I mean, I will never forget, uh, don't mean to put you on the spot, but when, um, when the Sultan, as they call Mr. Erdogan in Bosnia was serenaded by Mr. Dacic in uh, Belgrade, that was quite a performance. Um, um, and I, I don't know that right now what the, you know, the funding levels are of Turkey and Serbia and in Bosnia. And actually it's much less in Bosnia than I do know that in case somebody else knows, but, um, you know, it does seem that autocrats like one another, they all cling together. And anybody have any thoughts on Turkey's relationship to the Balkans? Kurt? Yeah, I mean, I, and this this connects with some of the points that were made earlier by Tana and others about the, the, the sort of modes of operation of geopolitical actors. I mean, uh, I think I think that uh, Erdogan has been trying to to develop a constituency, if you will, in the region. Uh, he also used Bosnia as a stage for for for, for a big rally uh, for his own elections. Uh, and, it has and, and the marriage, and also Izabegovic's daughter was just married, and he mm -hmm. invited Erdogan to the wedding, yep, which caused Mr. Dodik to appear on stage with the other two presidents. That was completely fascinating. Yeah, yeah. After he said, "I'm never going to come back to Sarajevo," you know, the usual shtick. Right. But, uh, right. but 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 he'll come for a power broker that that he wants to be seen with. Uh, I, it hasn't gotten the traction in terms of the popular level that I think Erdogan had been hoping for. Uh, but I, I think that that is one of the things that he tries to play up. For, and also for the domestic audience back in Ankara. That's the, I mean, certain Turkey as a whole. Uh, that's, that's my take. It, it, it doesn't feel as, uh, as oppressive, at least in Bosnia, which is the country and the region I know best, as, as it seemed to be galloping forward when I lived there and I left in 2016. Yes, um, I just, oh, Ivana, please, Ivana Stradner. Okay, so we would definitely need a separate, um, separate event on uh, Turkish, uh, relationship with the Balkans. But I will just say one thing. I agree with Tanya that the presence of Turkey in uh, Bosnia is still is still present, but not as it used to be. But where there is one area that we should definitely pay attention, which is how Russia and Turkey play day games in the Balkans. Mm. And Unfortunately, very few people pay attention to that. And if you, for example, take a look at what happened recently in Kosovo, 
we also need to take uh, that uh, into consideration. Before, for example, if you take a look at um, Washington um, agreement last year, the moratorium on uh, for further um, Kosovo recognition, uh, right now, uh, Turkey is back and, you know- um, You mean the Trump agreement? Yeah, yeah, the Trump, yeah, agreement, the Trump, Trump agreement. agreement. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that Washington agreement uh, didn't just mention uh, that he tended a wage, actually, a new campaign to increase the number of countries uh, recognize Kosovo. Uh, but also, uh, Erdogan is not happy with Vucic's uh, relationship with uh, with Israel. And there I can have multiple yeah, different, different examples go on and on. But just one thing that I would like to emphasize is that we should definitely pay more attention to Russia, Turkey's, uh, Russia Turkish games uh, in the Balkans, uh, especially in Kosovo. Interesting point. Uh, Lubomir, can you, um, can you, I mean, what a quagmire, what a, what a terrible situation in Montenegro, definitely in crises and, and uh, a split government. Uh, I'm sure that NATO is very concerned about Montenegro right now with its uh, incredible overt Russian influence within the government. Um, that's one of the reasons why Bosnia will not get into NATO anytime soon because of Mr. Dodik's role uh, within BIH. Um, so what, wh how do you see things proceeding at this point? Um, what, what is a way forward out of this quagmire? Is it, is it gonna have to be new elections? What, what do you think is uh, short term can be done to mitigate this this terrible situation. So what we are seeing at, at the moment right now is the calls for the reshuffle of the government in Montenegro. Uh, you have the European Greens member Mura, who is who's be, who's been used as a, as a, uh, a fig leaf to, to cover up the, the true nature of the government, which is a clerical nationalistic government in Montenegro. And as you know, in the past year, we've seen uh, some... Uh, um, some alarms about the security sector in Montenegro, uh, having in mind that the person, that the chief of the committee, the head of the committee, parliamentary committee for the security defense is a person who has been sentenced for the, uh, for his part in the coup attempt in 2016. And, and the person who is cooperating openly with the uh, Rodina party of, uh, from Russia, uh, and that you have a head of the national security, a person who is close to the Serbian Orthodox Church and Russian Orthodox Church, and you have some leaking incidents, uh, some clear messages sent from NATO were, were, were uh, during the last year were, were really disturbing. So at the moment, I don't think we're going to have a snap elections. I think this government will uh, continue that they will uh, they will. Uh, be present until the end of the, their mandate. Uh, the only pr problem is that I don't believe, as, as some of the experts from the region believe, that that URA, which is European Greece member, that it will be able to to, to control the situation. Uh, the government uh, in in my own hometown has been changed five years ago. So uh, uh, kingmakers, the small kingmakers such as URA, are now out of the picture. And, and if you know that uh, all the Tena, what Tena was saying uh, is true, that the, the current opposition is burdened with the corruption and state capture. And, and so, some of the examples that Tena was saying, I was an active participant of, of those events. Then you, it's tough. Uh, you don't have a, an, an, an uh, operating and an efficient opposition. And you see that the church and some of the radical elements are amassing power in Montenegro. And that's what's been troubling. And, and I'm afraid that in the next couple of years, we'll see some of the, uh, some of the changes that will not be pleasant. And if Montenegro becomes a tool uh, and, and of the Serbian, greater Serbian politics in the region, then the instability will, uh, will spill over, over our borders. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I'd like uh, Nicola and Leon to answer this. It's from the audience. 
Um, how do you suggest that the EU, NATO, or US should put pressure uh, onto Vucic? Uh, also, could you elaborate further on the current situation of the dialogue, uh, the Pristina Belgrade dialogue? And I, uh, Nicola, would you, would you uh, initially respond and then you, Leon? Well, that's a that's a really question, hard question. I would say, uh, if anybody had the answer, I guess we would uh, be living in a different kind of Western Balkans. Um, well, as I mentioned previously, the problem is that uh, EU accession was uh, was the carrot for both Belgrade and Pristina to engage okay. in the dialogue, to implement yeah. agreements, and to move towards this comprehensive normalization, which is certainly not going to be popular with the voters in either Serbia or Kosovo. So it's going to be a very unpopular solution, whatever is actually the, the, the final comprehensive agreement. And uh, since this carrot is now practically absent, uh, primarily because of situation in both Serbia and Kosovo, when it comes to rule of law, democracy in Serbia, media freedom, uh, and also this uh, pretty, I would say, uh, uh, the touched approach by the key EU member states and the European Union, we are all more or less aware that there is no clear commitment towards enlargement in the EU. Uh, it is not only France, uh, there are many other member states which are quite skeptical of the enlargement, but they're like hiding behind France. I mean, they used to hide behind France two years ago. Now some of them are hiding behind Bulgaria because it's blocking in Macedonia. And basically the situation is quite connected. Like when you see uh, a blockade of North Macedonia, despite everything that North Macedonia did in the past several years, I mean, since the regime changed 2017, they changed the name because of the accession. And then you see there has been no reward. Then of course, both leaders in Serbia and Kosovo are going to ask themselves, so why would we do it then? Why would we go with to, on, on the, to this road, you know, of painful compromises, if we cannot accept the, the 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 we cannot expect any kind of reward, and this is this is a big problem. So the carrot is more or less it's non-existent. Right. What can a stick be now? That's a very very hard hard uh, hard uh, question because any stick you might use can be beneficial to a certain degree, but any stick can also further destabilize situation. Uh, what I would uh, advocate for is to bring back credibility to the EU enlargement process. So to put things clear, Serbia and Kosovo have a clear EU perspective if they do this and that. And then not only uh, meaning so engaging the dialogue, but also doing all the necessary reforms when it comes to rule of law, establishing, reestablishing democracy and media freedom, etc. And then like like being being uh, uh, you know going through with it, beginning with North Macedonia, Albania, which are now waiting to actually open negotiations, but then also sending this kind of clear message to Serbia and Kosovo. This could be this could be the the the, the, the carrot that we have missed in recent years, and that could be there. Uh, again, and of course, the stick is also there because if if you have this kind of a carrot, then the stick is clear. There is no EU accession for you if you do not reform, if you do not engage in the dialogue. I mean, so both the stick and the carrot have to do with EU accession. This is how it used to be in the past. Unfortunately, this is how it is now because from from below, so from from the citizens of Serbia and Kosovo, you do not see any kind of. Uh, 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 let's say pressure to engage the dialogue to the normalized relations, as as we could see from all the polls, the dialogue is quite unpopular. Not the dialogue itself, but any specific solutions coming from the dialogue are quite unpopular in both Serbia and Kosovo. So it has to be the EU as a as a as a key player in this regard. Thank you, Leon. Thank you. I I agree with Nicola on uh, several points. I'll quickly highlight um, just some of the latest updates on the dialogue. So as you know, on the 30th of September, negotiators of Serbia and Kosovo met in Brussels. And uh, there were three key things that came out of that um, dialogue. One is that um, K4, as you know, was deployed to two different points on the, on the border. And uh, the agreement was for approximately two weeks. So uh, K4's uh, uh, presence at the border should come to an end fairly soon. Um, secondly, uh, they agreed that the sticker regime would kick in. I think it started on the 4th of October. Um, it's only a temporary solution. And then third, uh, there was a working group that was established between uh, Serbia, Kosovo and the EU. And this working group um, should be meeting on the 21st of October for the first time. Um, uh, and after that, every six months. The, the language was a little bit vague, but from what I understand is that their first 
focus should be to try and find a more permanent solution to the sticker regime. So in short, then, I don't think there's much going on in terms of the dialogue. It's looking at the symptoms rather than some of the key issues behind what led to the escalation of this, of this conflict. That's why I'm arguing that I think in order to move forward with the, uh, with the dialogue, which comes back to the first question that you asked, what should the US, EU and NATO do to move the process forward, especially um, uh, in terms of Serbia, we need unity of purpose. If the US and, and EU are not speaking the same language on this dialogue and we don't look at it from the same perspective, nothing happens. I would also say that the UK should be included in that. Um, that's really important because I think one of the casualties of the Brexit was also um, a lack of clarity on, on, on Balkan uh, policy from the EU perspective. Um, I think the, the, the UK has a number of uh, officials in the region who really understand Bosnia, for example, and some of the other situations that are um, uh, uh, brewing in the region. Um, so I think if, if the US, for example, is to play a constructive role, we need to get the, the EU's five laggards, uh, Cyprus, Greece, Romania, Slovakia, and Spain to recognize Kosovo, or at the very least not to obstruct um, some of the initiatives to bring Kosovo further into further integrate Kosovo into the international community. I also I, I don't think like NATO membership is necessarily uh, um, realistic right now, but I do think that um, in the absence of that, we should do two things. One, perhaps we should sign a robust agreement uh, with Kosovo, because I think uh, a defense agreement like that would kind of remove this idea that it's even remotely a possibility to just send tanks across the border and, and, and uh, reoccupy Kosovo. Uh, secondly, uh, related to that issue, I think that um, there should be massive, a lot more support by the transatlantic alliance for Kosovo security sector. Um, I think we need to you know, create some form of deterrence. One of the issues is we need uh, to, to uh, allow Kosovo to enter NATO's partnership for peace. Serbia joined the partnership for peace already in 2006, even though it regularly conducts military exercises with Russia and it has no NATO aspirations. So I, th I, th and I think Kosovo clearly wants to be a NATO member, I think we should allow it into that program. Thank you. Okay, so Beso wants to weigh in here. It's just very quickly, maybe for, for the Kosovo side, uh, to connect to something that Leon, Leon said at the beginning, uh, uh, speaking about the the space and the, the power that Serbia has compared to Kosovo, where, as you said, Kosovo has less space to maneuver. But I do think that there's something to also be paying attention to the new, uh, to, to the new government, because they are going to try to expand that space. And I think I think they're correct in, in, in some ways and not in, not in others, but that's I think that's what the uh, uh, the way they handled the, the reciprocity with the car plates, so the license plates, was a direct example of that. And I think that Kuti will continue to to take su such actions also by having a legal backing because for the decision that he took with the with the reciprocity over license plates, it, it was it was not not respecting the agreement, but it was actually just a. The one part of the agreement had ended, the expiration of the KS unmake uh, issued uh, plates. So then he just went and said, okay, this agreement, part of the agreement has expired now. We're going to uh, also introduce the same measures to, to Serbia. So he is looking to expand the, the space within which he can maneuver. And I do think that he's going to insist that Kosovo be also, also asked on, a, on the dialogue more. So because in this sense, so I do think that there's, that there's this aspect of it as well that has to be taken into account because that's the type of narrative that he's trying to to shift from Kosovo usually being more of a docile right, partner right. is expected to expected the one to take compromises to concede and whatnot he's really going to push those uh, 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 he's going to he's going to try to to shift that and rightly so for in a lot of ways. Okay, well I have one more really interesting question, and it's for Tana and. Um, Ivana Stradner, and uh, I'm going to give credit here to um, my good friend, Kurt. Um, can you give both of us, and this is really quick, thumbnail, uh, the influence of Russia and China and Croatia, and um, 
and you know i know that there's some big uh, oil gas gas uh, arrangements happening in zagreb i do know that and um and actually uh, ivana and i pointed out uh the role of you know bosnian croats working with the russians against bosnia uh tina do you want to i mean do you want to make some comments about china and russia in, in um croatia well how much time do we have <laughs> can we I go know. to dinner we together have, we have actually two minutes um, left wow so listen i mean it's a complicated situation uh, in which uh, on the one hand um, i mean you have this irony that uh, in croatia of course you know the hadeze is uh, the party that espouses more sort of conservative values and anti-serb values and therefore kind of anti-russian values you know it's sort of the subtext but they have been the party that's been most uh, uh, involved um, uh, with with russian actors in a way or the other uh, off the top of my head you had karamarko a few days ago um, that was involved in a scandal that was uh, related also to, to some uh, Russian companies through his, uh, uh, his uh, wife. Uh, there is the PPD, uh, which is the single fastest growing uh, company in a private company in Croatia yes, yes. that is headed by Pavel Vujnovac, who donated money for a campaign, uh, the presidential campaign of the Hadeze in Croatia a few years ago. Um, and this same company has uh, um, made a 10 year long uh, deal with, uh, with Gazprom for the um, providing of gas, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, you have a situation in which uh, specific political actors um, seem to be involved in a way or the other with, uh, uh, with some Russian companies, less actors for, for perhaps political gain um, and so on and so forth. But I mean, it's not as you know extensive and as uh, clear disinvolvement as it is, for instance, with uh, the Socialist uh, Party of Serbia, uh, with uh, uh, that Chichis party. Uh, the other thing that I would say in terms of China is that uh, the case of uh, you know contrast in Croatia with other uh, Western Balkan countries really shows this uh, uh, very ad hoc uh, strategy that uh, China has in the region. Um, <clears throat> if you contrast some of the deals that I mentioned earlier uh, by China and Western Balkans with the, the biggest uh, presence uh, in Croatia that they've had recently, it's a completely different ball game. Uh, so uh, a Chinese company has uh, managed to, um, uh, I mean, uh, to, to uh, build the Pelješac Bridge uh, in Croatia. Yes. Yes. But this, uh, this construction has been done fully according to EU rules, at least in terms of the tendering process. So there was a tender, uh, the various companies, including the Chinese one, have bid for it. Uh, the Chinese offer was the best one. They built the bridge and full stop. So, uh, you know, this tells you how adaptable the strategy is also of, uh, of these actors. And I'll, I will leave it here. Okay, Ivana. Ivana Stradner. Tina already explained everything and okay. gave very, very detailed answer. I really have nothing yet else okay. to add uh, for Croatia. I just want to repeat everything which she said, and I even learned a lot from uh, her presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. I want to actually thank Tina and Ivana Stradner, uh, who, you know, really helped me uh, on some, I was trying to find the right kind of people. They helped me with that and also talked through some strategies for today. This has been really good. I want to thank everyone that participated. It's, uh, it's, it's the most comprehensive uh, annual uh, roundtable we have had. And you all really tried to adhere to the timeline. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate that so much. And on behalf of Hiraman Institute, I wanna thank each and every one of you. And I hope soon we can get you to New York City. So my best to everyone. Thank you for all the links you dropped in. Thanks to our audience. Um, we, we, hit all, we hit all the uh, questions except one and I apologize for that. I'll take responsibility. Everyone have a great day wherever you are. And um, again, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Tanya, for organizing. Thank bye, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Tanya. Thank you.